All right, everyone, Nathan Lindor for the Rational Independent here. It's my last day in Hawaii, fly home tomorrow morning and finish my project in time to do one more video before we go. And the video, the article just has to be dealt with. This world is full of horrible liars and they just get paid to just spread, spread this mess out smear everything and call it victory, call it justice. It's, it's gross, but it's out there, so we got to deal with it. We're going to be quoting this article more extensively because this isn't just one bad point. This is a masterclass on poisoning the English language. Let's talk about it. From Salon.com, headline, Folks, the wait was worth it. Donald Trump is going to prison. Trump can't come back from this. He will never be president again and may well die in prison. The future awaits. This is not an opinion piece. This is not an editorial. This is written by a columnist for Salon. Genuine vetted reporter, a committer of many acts of journalism, apparently. This got 20,000 votes on Reddit. Oh, let's slog through it. Let's get into it. Let's see what's going on. Aha, uh -huh. so apparently his byline, he's a longtime White House correspondent. Finally, Donald Trump's depravities are laid bare for all to see in a court of law. All we've seen is an indictment. An indictment is not a trial. The court of law isn't even really involved yet. For one thing, for a grand jury, the prosecutor doesn't have to give the defense a voice, only has to show probable cause, only has to show basically a preponderance of evidence, i.e., is it possible? Is it slightly more possible than not that such a thing happened? And if that's the case, then you indict and you send it to trial. Methinks the lady, it's not a lady, but methinks the lady uh, is getting a little excited ahead of time. Either that or they're trying to squeeze as much juice as they can out of uh, these indictments. With the latest felony indictments handed down by Fulton County, Georgia, former President Donald Trump is accused of leading the Fulton 19, a loose assemblage of accused criminals, also known as the Enterprise, who face charges of trying to rig the 2020 election in Georgia. Let's tease that apart a little bit. First off, I pay a lot of attention to political and cultural commentary. I'm fairly plugged into this world. I've never heard the term Fulton 19 before. That's not a thing. Now, maybe he's making it a thing. Maybe he's trying to put it out into, you know, the make it part of the commentary. But as of right now, that's not a thing. That's wishful thinking. Specifically, the enterprise is accused of forgery, conspiracy to commit forgery, conspiracy to commit false statements and writings, <clears throat> filing false documents, influencing witnesses, conspiracy to commit election fraud, conspiracy to defraud the state, impersonating a public officer and a host of other charges. That sounds serious. It's an awful long list. <clears throat> it's a 96 page indictment. How do we know? Because he says buried deep in the 96 page indictment are some of the most disturbing accusations ever leveled at a president. We've had presidents accused of war crimes. Again, I think you might be getting a little too excited here. Indeed, they rival those levied against the New York mafia figures Rudy Giuliani once prosecuted while with the Department of Justice. You're saying, this is your own standard you're setting. You're saying this Georgia indictment levies charges on par. We talked yesterday about setting parity between things and saying that basically by saying the 14th Amendment bars Trump from running for president, much less being president, you are putting on par January 6th and the Civil War. That's their comparison. That's their reasoning. Here, we're saying that the Georgia indictment, all right, puts Donald Trump's actions on par with mob bosses. Now you'll notice they use the racketeering charges and the RICO statutes in both cases. 
Maybe that's how they made that comparison. But keep in mind that mafia bosses were, were guilty of conspiracy of theft, corruption, murder. It runs the gamut. But it was a serious criminal enterprise designed to enrich unlawful actors at the expense of the taxpayer and private businesses and anyone else that could be defrauded. That's the mafia. And his comparison says these charges rival those same charges. So let's see if it holds up. How low did Don the Con go? Pay attention, all you Christians. Oh, I love it when they use my religion when it's convenient. Trump is accused of using a pastor to intimidate witnesses. <gasps> I'm a Christian, so I must clutch my pearls and be utterly upset at such accusation. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't even get through it. Oh my dear, okay. Stephen Cliffguard Lee. Oh, have you heard of him? Because he's clearly a major player in national politics. Oh, no, he's not. No, we've never heard of him. Okay. <clears throat> Stephen Cliffguard Lee is accused of knocking on Ruby Freeman's door, frightening her and causing her to call 911 three times. If someone knocks on your door and won't go away and you're a single woman, I have a better solution than calling 911 three times. It's called the Second Amendment. I am fully supportive of anyone being able to defend their own life and their own property should some crazy person come knocking on their door wanting to threaten or intimidate them. It's a very effective deterrent against bullies of all flavors. But I'm betting this author wouldn't agree with me there. Lee appeared at the election worker's door roughly two weeks after Freeman and her daughter, Wandrea Shea Moss, that's a great name, were falsely accused by Trump of pulling fake ballots from suitcases in Georgia, with Trump suggesting they committed election fraud. Here we begin to see the crux of this story, and it does come back to kind of that Rorschach test idea that we talked about the other day. In order to follow the less logic, I'm gonna lay it out for you so you can see it as we go through it. Here's basically the logic. The election of 2020 is unassailable. It is intact. It's the greatest election ever. It was strongly fortified. It absolutely came to the right conclusion and under no circumstances should it be questioned because it was so clearly that case so absolute black and white. Hey, they, we found something they believe in, in black and white, in this relativistic moral world. The left believes the 2020 election, black and white. No room for debate, no room for conversation, no room for investigation, no room for questioning, no room for accusations. It just completely is true that the Democrats won the presidential election in 2020. And because that's the case, everyone has to know that and agree with that. Everyone knows that the Democrats carried Georgia. Everyone knows that President Biden got more votes than Barack Obama in predominantly black districts. He was more popular than President Obama. That's just absolutely, definitely what happened. And since that definitely is what happened and no one could rationally argue that point. If you say or do anything that goes contrary to the election, you're a liar committing fraud. Fraud is a crime, especially if you manage to take something from someone. What they're saying is, because the election was totally righteous, brave and true and all that stuff and unassailable, if you are arguing against that election result, then you want to undermine democracy. You want to lie to the American people. You want to use false pretenses to defraud the American public from the righteous, real, just outcome of their election. And instead, you want to take it and twist it and use it to your own ends. Basically, from here on out in the article, and I read the Georgia indictment today because that's my life right now, Throughout the Georgia indictment, it rests on the premise that anyone who worked with Trump 
in any capacity to contest the election in 2020, either at a state level or federal level, was part of a criminal conspiracy to defraud the American people. And every action they took to help in that fight was evidence of actions taken in overt acts in furtherance of the conspiracy. That's the legal case. That's the reasoning. Here's the thing that's insane about that. This is a state of mind crime, okay? You are allowed in the law to be wrong. You are allowed in the law to make a judgment call and genuinely pursue whatever conclusion you're pursuing and be wrong and be mistaken, and that's not a crime. But if you present information, particularly in a public context, that you know is false, then it becomes fraud then it becomes the intent to deceive and to take from someone through that deception. As an example, I am selling kitchenware and I get a shipment of pressure cookers from China and I decide to go ahead and test one and it explodes. So I test another one and it explodes and I realize that almost every single one of this batch of pressure cookers is going to explode if I use it. If I then turn around and sell these pressure cookers, when I know I'm endangering people's lives so that I can profit from that, I have committed fraud. If I say to you, listen, these are gonna explode, so maybe we should sell these down in Mexico. Listen, would you mind throwing them in your truck and driving them down to Mexico and I'll help sell them? Sure, you know, I'll pay you 200 bucks, perfect, okay. So I paid you and compensated you and you've taken an action in conspiracy with me in order for us to profit from the sale of these things that we know will harm people. We know they're defective. The root comes from the knowledge that it's false. We are not selling pressure cookers. We're selling defective things that are gonna hurt people badly. We know that what we're selling doesn't match what we say we're selling. Therefore, it's fraud. What that means is in order to carry this off in order for this to work it starts from the premise that the left has set it up to say we have to convince a jury that president trump knew he lost the election immediately after he lost it pretty sure if you pay two seconds of attention he still thinks he won he has been beating the drum that 2020 was stolen from him that he is convinced that the worlds of Hugo Chavez's ghosts and the Kraken and all these things are going to come. One day his ship's going to come through and his nightmare will be over and he'll be president again. He might be delusional. He's allowed to be delusional. He might be wrong. He's allowed to be wrong. That means it's not fraud. If he, in good faith, is arguing the case, making motions in court, putting cases together and arguments for cases to try and push for, the, for a different outcome. If he's trying to contest the outcome of the election in a given state, then there are channels to do. And you need to talk to people and have antagonistic conversations with people in power, with, with officials saying, listen, we think this is wrong. We think this is stolen from us. We are not accepting it. We are challenging it. That's what you do. That's allowed. You can be wrong. You can be delusional. You can fail in your case. It's not fraud. And their entire case rests on the fact that Donald Trump was committing fraud and therefore everyone who helped him was conspiring with him. And therefore, because we have this big conspiracy, now we can use the RICO statute and we can take all the actions of anyone in this conspiracy and pile them all on Trump and send him to prison. Now that we've run through the logic, let's look at the reporting because it is a mess. Lee appeared at the election worker's door roughly two weeks after Freeman and her daughter were falsely accused by Trump, accused by Trump. Nobody knew if it was false or true. It hadn't been proven in court. It was an accusation for which there was evidence. Whether there was evidence or not, whether if it was just his opinion, it's still an accusation that's allowed, that's called speech. 
He's allowed to do that. Accused by Trump of pulling fake ballots from suitcases in Georgia, with Trump suggesting they committed election fraud. Well, the world is a binary place. Either there was fraud or there wasn't fraud. Either this woman and her daughter were pulling fake ballots out of suitcases in order to tip the election in the favor of their favored candidate and help Joe Biden carry the state. Either they were doing that or they were not. Accusing someone of that is not a crime. Contesting the results of an election is not a crime. Using strong language to describe the actions of someone who is arguably doing the worst possible, one of the worst possible things in our republic, undermining our faith in the election process, i.e. an election worker who is subverting the will of the people by stuffing ballots. If Trump is right, he's a hero of the republic. If he's wrong, he's a sour grapes loser. Neither one of those things is a crime. Now, election fraud, that is a crime. <sighs> okay. Lee is on videotape, this guy that was knocking on the door, saying he wanted to speak with Freeman because he had some pro bono services to offer her and he was also working with some folks who are trying to help Ruby out and also get to the truth of what's going on. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't know who this guy is. I don't see why this is important or we care. Other than he was probably scratching around, he was probably scratching around looking to see if he could find some way to help his buddy Donald Trump. That's not illegal. Maybe he's acting as a private investigator. Maybe he's just a citizen. Maybe he's part of some grand organized conspiracy. Maybe some lawyer who works for Trump paid him a thousand bucks to go knock on her door and bother her, see what he could shake loose. That's okay. None of this is a crime. He didn't threaten her with violence. He didn't attack her. He didn't break into her house. He was being a nuisance. You're allowed to be a nuisance. Lee is a former police chaplain and pastor from Chicago. He is specifically charged with attempting to influence witnesses and conspiring, conspiring to solicit false statements and writings. He's also accused of traveling from outside of the state to intimidate Freeman and solicit her to falsely confess to election crimes she did not commit. Take the editorializing out of that. By the way, that's a quote that's from the charge. That's not from the reporter intimidate Freeman and solicit her to falsely confess to election crimes she did not commit. Do you think he went up to her and said, listen, I need you to lie and give me a fake confession that you committed election fraud. We both know you're innocent, but I need you to lie anyway because it's really going to help Trump out. Can you do that for me? Do you, do, you, do you really think that's how the conversation went? Uh, no, that's not how the conversation went. I guarantee, I wasn't there, but I can guarantee nobody would have that conversation. Instead, it probably went like, listen, we know you did this and you know you did this and you need to come clean. Maybe much better. Maybe he was trying to have a come to Jesus talk with her, former pastor and all, say, listen, you need to be honest. He's allowed to do that, okay? That's having a conversation between two private parties. How is that intimidating a witness and to getting her to soliciting her to falsely confess to election crimes she did not commit. Now comes the editorializing. And again, I love the fact that the godless left just just jumps on the Christian verbiage just enough, just enough to give themselves a little credibility whenever it's convenient. While you try to wrap your head around a pastor bearing false witness against his neighbor, a violation of the ninth commandment, remember? Here's a question. What do you call 100 lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? A good start? Trump's latest legal team? What? That's a verbatim quote, by the way. I think he was trying to be funny. I think that joke stopped being funny. Maybe when I was 11, I stopped telling that joke because it's really not that funny. But no, this is serious, serious journalism. The shocking thing about Trump's latest indictment is not how depraved he is but how easily he manipulated others into helping him, those who had little or nothing to gain and everything to lose. Yeah, what you're saying is he successfully and even easily convinced these reputable, powerful people to sacrifice their reputations in an effort to help him when they had nothing to gain. He must be the most amazing salesman ever. Or 
good people of conscience saw it differently than you do, disagreed with the public stance, the narrative that all was well and nothing, nowhere, you know, no reason to look here, and said, that's worth looking into. And they were willing to put their reputations on the line in order to do that investigation. That's more likely to me than Trump whispered hypnotic voodoo and got all of these respectable people to throw away their uh, their reputation. But that's the position the, the, you know this, this wonderful journalist is taking. His debauchery. Oh, good, debauchery. That's a fun word. I don't think that word means what they think it means. Can be summed up in a statement Trump made himself referenced on page 18, section five of the indictment. In one instance, Donald Trump stated to the acting United States Attorney General, just say that the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. Debauchery, extreme indulgence in sensual pleasures, orgies, seduction. Uh, I don't think this reporter is as smart as he thinks he is. That's not what debauchery means. Maybe he meant debasement. Maybe he meant lack of morals. Maybe he meant a bunch of other words, but words matter. Use them right. So let's take this quote, because they finally, finally we have a little quote to work with. We have some actual substance. Quote from Donald Trump. Just say that the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. Here's one way of interpreting that. Hey, Attorney General, lie and steal, help me steal the election. That's the interpretation they want you to hear. Here's another possible interpretation. Just throwing this out there. One, something for you to consider, okay? Hey, there's some weird crap going on here that we probably don't have time to deal with through the court system. Let's look for a way to use the electoral remedy of the representative legislative body and uh, of the American government and sort it out that way. In other words, let the co-equal branch of government, i.e. Congress, the legislative body, have a voice in this, have a say in this conversation. Guess what? That's probably not very well reasoned, probably not effective, probably not gonna get you the result that you want. He's allowed to be wrong, he's allowed to be foolish, he's allowed to be vain. It's not evidence of crime. He's trying to persuade. It's not a slam dunk. Donald Trump says a lot of crap. That's who he was when the, the American people elected him. Unless, of course, they never elected him because of Russian interference. But the 2016 election is totally allowed to be questioned and totally allowed to spend three years chasing after it and relitigating it and undermining the presidency of Donald Trump and doing our best to, to good after the credibility of the election. And boy, it was razor thin margins, so it's definitely contestable and we should definitely push on all those buttons and see what we could do about flipping various states who had very thin margins of, oh, except that was 2016. But if we did the same thing in 2020, it's the worst thing ever. It's debauchery. I don't know the rules. It's not just Republican congressmen who are accused of helping him out. Oh no! I have an accusation for you. You helped Trump. That's not an accusation. You're allowed to help the president. You're allowed to help Donald Trump as a private citizen. If you're a congressman, you are empowered as an elected representative to do stuff in government. That's not a charge for you to be accused. Ugh. According to the indictment, Trump corrupted f quite a few attorneys. Lawyers are usually bound by ethics. Oh yeah. The world knows lawyers are very ethical, moral people who always make the right choice. But about a half dozen of them who serve Trump will probably be bound over for trial. One person who knows well what can happen to lawyers serving Trump is his former personal attorney, Michael Cohen. Oh, we haven't heard from him in a while. Let's see. Michael Cohen, we haven't heard from him in a while. Why is that? Oh yeah. He was convicted of criminal tax evasion, campaign campaign finance violation, and lying to Congress. He's convicted of perjury, and they're trotting him out as a witness to undermine Trump's credibility. Oh, 
Michael Cohen says, every single one of the Fulton 19 should beware of the Donald. Donald is, Trump is setting up all the co-indicted individuals for the bigly fall, including Rudy. Donald will not help out any of them financially, claiming it might be considered improper for him or his PAC to pay their legal fees, as he too is named a defendant. Yeah, that's actually probably pretty solid reasoning. Either way, it's not illegal reasoning. It's not unethical reasoning. It's actually approaches the semblance of a moral argument. It's called conflict of interest. Ugh. Jenna Ellis is apparently the first to fall. Oh, poor Jenna, what happened? She has said nice things about Ron DeSantis, which earned her a quick trip under the bus. She appeared with Rudy Giuliani at a December 3rd, 2020, hearing hosted by state Republican lawmakers at the Georgia Capitol. Okay, so she's at a hearing. I think that's legal. In the Georgia Capitol, okay. During which false allegations of election fraud were made. You could just say allegations of election fraud, okay? Unless you can prove that she factually knows that she was lying and that she chose to lie in intent to defraud, they're not false allegations. They're allegations made in good faith that based on what we've all decided, we've decided ended up not being true. These are two different things, but we gotta have the editorializing in there. She also wrote at least two legal memos, oh my goodness, legal memos to Trump and his attorneys advising that Pence should disregard certified electoral college votes from Georgia and other purportedly contested states. Um, so purportedly means it's kind of like allegedly. It's saying these, these apparently were contested states and contested is in quotes. You're saying that the other side wasn't contesting these states while they were making allegations of election fraud at a hearing held by the Georgia legislature. So the Georgia legislature holds a hearing to discuss whether or not the state's election went properly, but you put contested in quotes to make it weaker, to make it sound like they weren't really contested. It's a foregone conclusion. By the way, the margin of victory in Georgia was less than a quarter of a percent. You could go ahead and say that's probably contestable. Just throwing that out there. And by the way, lawyers are allowed to write memos. They are allowed to advance legal theories. They are guns for hire, okay? A lawyer's job is to be a technical expert in the law. And for a client to come to them and say, can you find a way within the law to make the case for this outcome that I want? And the lawyer scratches around their knowledge and their brain and their research, and they can come back and say, well, we could say this, we could say this, we could say this, we could say this. It's a legal opinion, okay? It's not a lie. It's not fraudulent. It's a legal opinion. It's a little bit like a medical opinion, all right? The only person who has claim against that lawyer for bad legal advice is the person who got the legal advice. They can claim and sue their lawyer for bad advice, for ineffective use of counsel or whatever the term is, okay? You can't have the justice system go after a lawyer because they presented a legal theory that's tenuous at best and would probably get laughed out of court. That's literally a lawyer's job. She did her job and gave a memo to lawyers that worked with Trump. Here's a legal theory about something we could try and do. That's not a crime. Mm. What does she get for that effort? No loyalty from Trump. Ellis's attorney, Mike Mita Melito, has apparently set up an online donations account to pay her legal expenses. Because she's paying her own expenses and asking for people to help her pay her legal expenses, that's Trump's fault? They just, they need Trump to be the devil. All right, we are, I'm running long on time and there's just so much more nonsense here. So I'm not gonna read the whole thing. We're gonna have to just go ahead and see. All right, da, 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 da. see if there's anything useful. So after he goes through talking about all the people that are conspirators, people got roped into this, all these people that got corrupted by Donald Trump's debauchery. So we have the former dean of a law school and a bunch of highly qualified attorneys, some of them high-ranking officials with decades of experience, 
Now they all face prison time in addition to never being able to practice law again. What happened to ethics in that profession? Maybe these are men of principle and women who made a decision to put their reputation on the risk, or a reputation at risk, in order to fight for what they believe is right, and the power of the state is coming down on them to punish them for going against that institutional power. That makes sense to me. I don't think that's their ethics that need to be questioned. I do love how sometimes these reporters wax lyrical. They like to just evoke this wonderful visionary language, this imagery that's just so emotionally laden. I think that's why we use debauchery in this article. Okay, I'm just gonna read this because it's beautiful. This political writer just really wants to be a novelist. The indictment in Georgia is a sledgehammer blow to Donald Trump's solipsistic and fictional reality, where he's the good guy and the rest of the political world is out to get him by conducting a mythical witch hunt, complete with ogres, monsters from the underworld, vampires, and lycanthropes. Turns out the only beast in the woods is Donald, and he corrupted at least 18 named co-conspirators. A sledgehammer blow is fictional reality. A mythical witch hunt, ogres, lycanthropes. Okay, this author unironically used the word lycanthrope. For those of you who are not nerds, that's a werewolf, a lycanthrope. They use that word in a political analysis article about Donald Trump. Someone got really excited. For everyone who complained the investigation was taking too long, and for the record, I wasn't one of them. I can only say the wait was worth it. Donald Trump has now been charged in four different jurisdictions and faces 91 felony counts with more to come. I hope, quote, I hope it is a weight around his neck like an albatross with the density of a black hole, his niece Mary Trump said on her podcast this week. Okay, so clearly she's got an axe to grind. I know that some of her testimony has been used to shore up other parts of these criminal matters. Pretty sure a comment like that makes it clear she's not an unbiased witness. Just so this is adorable too. I've got to throw this in here. Trump and his minions are desperately trying to pivot, but it's much like toilet paper pivoting after it's already been flushed. The goal of the MAGA movement is to call out the Justice Department as weaponized while accusing President Biden of being the head of a crime family and his son Hunter of being a bigger criminal than Trump. In other words, what Trump is facing in 91 felony charges, his supporters hope to deflect onto Biden. Where did the $20 million come from? There are provable bank transactions that show that the Biden family received at least $20 million while Biden was vice president from foreign sources. Where did that money come from and why? I know my family doesn't get $20 million from foreign sources. I know your family doesn't do that either. What is the reason for that money to flow towards the Bidens if not for influence with the vice president? There's no other conceivable reason I can think of. And if you're selling influence with an elected official and you are receiving money as an extended family for that influence peddling, that's a criminal conspiracy. You have a profit motive. You have laws that are being broken. You have evidence of coordination within various members of the conspiracy. As you look at the way money flows, decisions are made, influences is handled, etc. And you look at policy decisions that are made and actions that are taken by those who are being influenced, that's a criminal conspiracy. But that whole thing gets neatly wrapped up in a bow without really describing it and presented to those on the left as, that's not really a thing to consider. That's just something that President, Bi President Biden is the victim of those darn MAGA Republicans trying to twist Donald Trump's corruption so that it lands on the Bidens. It's all political posturing. No need to look at the man behind the curtain. If you believe that, you're a dope.
a century from now if justice is served. Donald Trump and the Fulton 19 will be a historical afterthought, a minor flatulence laughed at by school children, dismissed by adults and ignored by the rest of the world. Trump's hotels will become homeless shelters. Perhaps Alcatraz will be reopened and doing business as the Trump Presidential Library and forever noted in history as the last home of Donald Trump before he shuffled off his mortal coil. His business acumen will be taught as cautionary tales of grift his statementship dismissed as quackery and his promises remembered as broken dreams that only enhance the rich and trampled on the downtrodden during the COVID pandemic, he helped to exacerbate. That is his future. How do you write this stuff? I mean, seriously, how do you write this kind of stuff with a straight face? But this is, this is how the, le this kind of vitriol, this kind of, extreme rhetoric is how they see this issue. I don't know anybody on the left who looks at Donald Trump and is willing to see it through rational eyes. They have embraced the narrative that he's the devil incarnate and therefore it is a moral imperative that we find a way to banish the devil and send him to prison. I don't get it. I don't get it but he lives in their head rent free. It's not a very comfortable place to be. He offers a little vignette from a recent Biden speech, nice fluffy nothings, and then says, Biden has his problems. His communications team stinks. His outreach is questionable. He commits gaffes as he always has. Still, he has restored a sense of normalcy to the presidency even as his enemies try to sacrifice his son at the altar of Trump. I'm pretty sure you can go after Hunter Biden and also not like Trump. That's not the same thing. Flinging endless accusations, nearly all of them so far provably false or evidence free. So all of the accusations against Hunter Biden, or nearly all of them, I wonder which ones nearly all doesn't cover. Hmm. So far, so maybe we'll get new evidence, who knows? So far, provably false or evidence-free. Bullshit. When all else fails, they go back to wanting to prosecute Hillary Clinton. If you have evidence, present it or shut up. Oh, you want to talk about evidence that Hillary Clinton broke the law? Yeah, I, I got some of that. Or did you want to talk about evidence that Hunter Biden broke the law? Because I got some of that too. Or did you want evidence that Joe Biden broke the law? Because I've got evidence of that too. Or did you want me to not present that and just shut up? I think, I think you meant just shut up. But Donald Trump is the one who faces 91 felony charges. Donald Trump is the one now facing trial for violating Georgia's racketeering laws, hoarding classified documents, leading an insurrection and making questionable business deals. The future is clear for those who can see. Donald Trump will never be president again. He will likely be in prison this time next year. And the future after that is wide open. The stage is set. Let the dance commence. Again. The flowery language just, it just kills me, given the subject matter. But right at the end, he betrayed the motive. The world, the future is wide open after we banish Trump. We cannot have Donald Trump as part of our political process. If we do, we are trapped in a prison of our own making, and he's going to destroy everything that is right and true and just and wonderful in the world he must be gone, whether it means prison or death. We need him out of the picture. And then it's all sunshine and rainbows and definitely not World War III after that. Yeah, that sounds about right. In case you're wondering about the Georgia indictment and you haven't had the time to do research of your own, let me offer two tidbits. Okay. So we talked about how the evidence is Donald Trump is lying and he's getting other people to lie with him, which means that we have a conspiracy 
to lie to the, the American people. And therefore, we need to show concerted efforts, acts, overt acts in furtherance of a conspiracy in order to make the legal case that we have a conspiracy because we need to have the conspiracy in order to employ the RICO statute and send Donald Trump to prison. That's the Georgia theory of the case. So in the indictment, they have something like 50 or 60, I, I stopped counting after a while, specific acts undertaken to show evidence of intentional acts taken by members of the conspiracy in furtherance of this racketeering enterprise. Some of them are definitely worth investigating. Some of them look a little skeevy. Some of them look questionable. Arguably, most of those were not committed by Donald Trump. So it only becomes something you can hang around his neck if you can prove a conspiracy that ties all these people together into one enterprise. It's basically saying, hey, if we take a political movement and we take some of the loopiest, craziest people on the fringes and we place seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, connect the dots, and we take this crazy person and we, and we say, okay, legally, we're gonna make this political actor responsible for the crazy person's actions, lump them all together and hang that person, hang it all around the neck of that political actor. It's a bad precedent to set. I'll give you two acts that are in the indictment, okay? These are acts that the DA put into the legal charging document to show evidence of this terrible criminal conspiracy that we were promised was a charge levied parallel, equal in severity to when Rudy Giuliani prosecuted mob bosses in New York. Murder, corruption, theft, etc. cetera, you name it. Donald Trump tweeted the hearings for the Georgia election are on OAN, you should go watch that. He promoted public hearings on a publicly available broadcast channel, news channel, that was discussing the deliberate and deliberating with the legislature about whether or not the election was valid. He promoted those hearings. That is an overt act in furtherance of his conspiracy. Another one that jumped out of my mind that I rather enjoyed, someone I've never heard of, booked a conference room at a hotel so that people involved in this crazy conspiracy could meet and strategize about how to contest the elections. Booking a conference room is a separate independent act in the indictment listed as an overt act in furtherance of a conspiracy. So if you tweet about public hearings by the legislature or you book a conference room as you were likely instructed to do by your employer, these are acts that show evidence of a criminal conspiracy on the level of New York Mafia Dons. What? <laughs> That's my very long Reddit rant for today. Thank you all for your time and your patience. Good luck out there.